Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to the first official uh, and inaugural UCSF Family and Community Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to, um, to launch Grand Rounds with you involved. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start, just so everyone knows this session is um, being recorded by UCSF. Um, uh, it is a webinar style, so please type your questions uh, into the Q&A box and we will um, we will answer as many as we can. Any ones that we don't get to, we will find a way to address later on. And you're always, always, as always, encouraged to reach out to the speakers if you have additional questions. I wanna do a little uh, commercial for upcoming Grand Rounds. Um, we have some great ones scheduled for this year. They will be the first uh, Friday of the month, every month uh, at noon from 12 to uh, one, or actually uh, 10 of one. So you can make it to your next activity on time. Uh, and they will be all via Zoom. If people have ideas or suggestions for Grand Rounds, please let us know. Um, my name is Margo Venner. I'm the Vice Chair for Education here in the Department of Family Medicine at UCSF. I put my, um, my contact down at the bottom uh, if you have suggestions or ideas about uh, other topics or things we could do better. Um, another commercial uh, is that the UCSF uh, Family Medicine Rodnick Colloquium is coming soon at the end of May. Submissions. Uh, uh, for an abstract or presentation are due March 12th. We encourage everyone to, uh, to submit some work to share with our, with our group of uh, 10, uh, 10 Alliance uh, residency programs. Um, if you have any technical problems during this session, um, uh, Roy Johnson's number is uh, listed on the screen. And most importantly, I wanna give a huge um, thanks to uh, several folks, uh, Dr. Stuart Meneker, who really got us started with the uh, UCSF primary care Grand Rounds, he's been an inspiration for getting people together to talk about important topics. Um, uh, Marcella Asukar, uh, Roy Johnston, and Benjamin Wallen, um, and the entire UCSF tech team that are supporting our work today. So we're, we really appreciate everyone's hard work already to get this started. Um, and let's see if I can get my slide to show. There we go. And so the topic that we're going to be uh, we're going to be sharing with you today is the Lancet report on uh, public policy and health in the Trump administration. Um, as you already know, the the Lancet Commission was the first report on public policy during the Trump era that was really a comprehensive assessment of health and health needs, health effect, not just in, during the past four years and the previous 40 and the previous 400. So we have some fantastic uh, presentations today. Our presenters will be um, Dr. Kevin Grumbach, who is a uh, UCSF uh, Hellman Endowed Professor uh, at UCSF uh, Family Medicine and also our beloved department chair. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Juliana Morris, um, who is a uh, primary care physician at Mass General uh, Chelsea Healthcare Center. She's also an instructor at Harvard Medical School, and uh, possibly most importantly, uh, is a uh, beloved alumni of the UCSF uh, Family Medicine Residency Program, uh, and we're excited to have her here. Um, our moderators today, uh, uh, our moderators are uh, uh, Dr. Michelle uh, Loaf, who's a uh, phenomenal uh, third-year family medicine resident here at UCSF and, uh, and uh, really worked hard to get us launched in the right direction. So thank you, Michelle. And I will be working with Michelle to answer your questions. We'll do, um, after our presenters have given the presentation, we will be reading your questions from the Q&A and then we will um, be asking them to the presenters. If your questions don't get answered today, again, I would encourage you to reach out directly to the presenters or to us. Um, it will be a great way to spur more dialogue, but we will we will do our best to get everybody's questions answered. Um, so with no further ado, I will give you the presentation and move on to Dr. Grimbach. Thanks. Thanks so much, Margo. And thank you to the entire team for mounting this uh, exciting new venture in Family Community Medicine Grand Rounds at UCSF. It's really an honor to be uh, the speaker today, and it's particularly a delight to share this presentation with my fellow Lancet Commissioner, uh, Juliana Morris. So Juliana, thanks so much for joining us today. So let me go ahead and get my slides teed up. Um, so the Lancet Commission, Public Policy and Health in the Trump Era. Uh, this report was published by the Lancet Journal last month, and you can see here it was a, a large group of people on the commission who contributed uh, this report. 
Let me tell you a little bit about how these uh, Lancet Commission reports work. Richard Horton is editor in chief of the Lancet Journal. So for those, I think many of you know, but Lancet is essentially the New England Journal of Medicine of, uh, of, of the United Kingdom in many ways of Europe, a very prominent journal. Uh, Richard Horton is the editor and he periodically will convene commissions to address compelling issues uh, in health. Uh, some of them have addressed things like climate change and immigration and health. In 2017, he organized a commission specifically to look at public policy and health in the Trump era, thinking that the signs were rather ominous after the election in November 2016 that the fate of both the health in the United States and the health of the world uh, was going to be challenged uh, with the new administration coming into office. He invited Steffi Woolhandler and David Himmelstein to chair the commission, and then there were a total of 33 of us uh, serving as commission, commissioner, commissioners from the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, including uh, myself and Juliana. Our charge was to chronicle the repercussions on health of the Trump administration's actions to essentially have a group of people with some expertise and interest to really uh, record what were the actions and what were gonna be the implications for health. Second, to put the Trump administration in more of a historical concept, context, so we know how did we get here? What was the history particularly of policies related to health uh, and the welfare of a society that, uh, that led up to this? And then really to also put out recommendations towards a healthier future for the United States as well as the globe. Our framing conceptual way of thinking about this as we distilled the report was 4, 40, and 400. So what do I mean by that? We looked at four years of the health harming policies under the past administration. But then we stepped back a bit and said, those four years are in the context of what are actually 40 years of deteriorating health in the United States. And I'll provide some information about that. And then we realized, boy, it's not just 40 years. We really have to step back and put it in a 400 year context because so much of health in the United States and particularly inequities in health are rooted in this long, many centuries of genocide uh, and enslavement of people of color and indigenous populations of Africans um, and indigenous people in this, um, in this country. And that that has shaped a lot of what has uh, gone on in health. So let me start by reviewing the disastrous last four years. I mean, they just objectively have been an abysmal failure in health policy. Uh, this classic quote of you know, Trump's wishful thinking that the COVID a pandemic was just going to disappear. So let me touch on some of the things we highlighted uh, in the Lancet Commission report on the last four years. This slide shows life expectancy in the United States over uh, many decades. And what you can see is how it's really plateaued. And, and in truth, in all fairness, I guess I would have to say to the Trump administration, the plateauing happened a little before. Uh, President Trump was inaugurated in January of 2017, but it's leveled off. And then you just see this plummeting of life expectancy associated with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic's arrival. And as you know, you know, there are tremendous inequities according to race, ethnicity, as well as class in the United States. This just shows a difference in life expectancy based on these racial ethnic groups. And that G6 average is comparing life expectancy within each of these specific racial ethnic groups with the average life expectancy in the other nations in the G7. These are the other uh, wealthy nations in the world, such as Germany, Canada, Japan. And, and what you see, even among whites in the United States, there is a gap between life expectancy and the average in the other countries in the G7. And it's particularly uh, you know, inequities for Black and Native American populations. So let's start with the first and most glaring failure of uh, political leadership in the last four years. And that's the total 
uh, malfeasance in managing the COVID pandemic. What we noted in the Lancet Commission report is, you know, Trump had already taken actions even more before the first reported case of COVID-19 in China to totally weaken the infrastructure for public health and the pandemic response in the United States. So in his first year of office, the CDC put in a hiring freeze that left uh, many positions vacant. Uh, uh, the Trump administration blocked the uh, policies in the Occupational Safety and Health Administration around things like airborne pathogen controls in the workplace. Uh, he abolished the global health security team. This has been a team that had been established in the federal government for pandemic preparedness. Uh, so that was eliminated. Um, and just the whole attack on science, on uh, government, the uh, health agency left a huge amount of positions unfilled as people left their positions in scientific offices um, in the federal government. Uh, and then, as you know, once the pandemic got here, uh, the Trump administration pulled the United States out of the World Health Organization. Uh, they blocked and just were such an impediment to effective uh, pandemic response. And the net outcome of all this, if you look at the toll of COVID in the United States, now well over 500,000 deaths, and, and you know, we all know that, that it had a terrible toll in many countries across the globe, uh, including in Europe. But even in countries, you know, when you include Italy and you include the United Kingdom, when you look at all the other G6 nations or the G6 other than the United States, what you see is our death rate was 65% higher uh, than the mortality rate in these other countries. So that if we had had the same rates of death from COVID in those other G7 nations, we would have had 160,000 fewer deaths from COVID uh, in 2020. So potentially, you know, a huge number of deaths that could have been prevented by more capable public health leadership in the United States. Environmental policies, closely related clearly to COVID. Uh, boy, this was an absolute, um, just uh, horrifying, a set of policies uh, rolling back. And most of these can be done with executive action that didn't even require congressional action of just totally rolling back uh, policies within the environmental protection areas, Department of Transportation. This is one of the tables from the Lancet Commission, but the actual table is about four times this length. So these are just a sample, but you have to read the report, but it's just horrifying to just see the number of policies to protect the environment, to try to, uh, to do something about this steady march towards uh, just horrible global warming were uh, just rolled back so extensively uh, under the administration. And these already have had, uh, are taking a toll on the health of the people of this country. Uh, this slide shows the number of deaths every year attributable to environmental exposure or occupational exposure. This was produced by Phil Landrigan, one of the commissioners in his research group, uh, Phil Landrigan is really a, just a global expert in environmental health. And what you can see is this uptick that started in 2017 in the number of people uh, dying every year from uh, these types of environmental and occupational exposures. And again, that's pre-COVID. Pre Barber's treatment of immigrants and refugees. Again, you are all well aware of this. Uh, just um, kind of really, I think, hurtful to the sense of who we are as a society and uh, caring people. And the thing to real about, realize about this is it obviously uh, was punishing on uh, the families who were separated, on children who have spent uh, many of them a year or more separated from their loved ones and parents, of people as you see in these cages and horribly unhealthy conditions, but it has a ripple effect. Uh, this is a, a study we cited in the commission report that looked at preterm births to Latino women in the United States and compared pre-Trump uh, pre to post-Trump uh, months. And what you can see, this is separated by uh, this, this, the gender of the, of the babies, but you can see uh, the study said, what was the expected number of preterm births and then what actually happened? And it certainly seemed like there was an uptick in preterm births uh, following uh, Trump taking office. The sense of this whole attack on immigrants uh, is traumatizing to people, uh, particularly folks from immigrant backgrounds or certain ethnicities in the United States and, and was a very health damaging um, 
action for the health of the public. Healthcare I can sum it up in two simple phrases, coverage went down and profits went up. Here's a tracking the number of people who have absolutely no form of health insurance in the United States. And what you can see here is after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, there was a decline in the number of uninsured, and then it shot way up starting in 2019 and 2020. And a bunch of that uptick is related to the economic impact of COVID, people losing their jobs, losing their job-related health insurance, but there was actually an increase in the number of people who are uninsured before COVID arrived. You know, all the attacks on the Affordable Care Act, Trump was not successful in repealing the Affordable Care Act, but certainly weakened uh, several of its measures, measures that already uh, started this moving in the direction of reductions in coverage. And yet at the same time, this, this slide is showing the overhead and profits retained by health insurance companies sorted by whether they're in the group employment uh, market or Medicare Advantage or Medicaid Managed Care. And you see those green bars that, again, in the year the pandemic exploded in the United States, there was actually more of the healthcare dollars were retained by health insurance company in the form of overhead and profits than in the years prior. Uh, so the sense of where is all this money that we're spending in healthcare actually going, and it's and a huge amount when you compare it to a country like Canada, is wasted in administrative costs and profits and just a tremendous bureaucracy from this complicated fragmented system that is just not true in other countries that tend to have a universal publicly uh, sponsored insurance schemes. Related to that was the tax cut. <laughs> tax cut. Uh, the Trump administration actually moved very little major legislation through Congress, but one of the most uh, high impact measures that was enacted uh, was the tax cut of 2017. And this just shows you the amount of money uh, that people uh, had in terms of reduction of their federal taxes based on their uh, household income. You see very little of this went to people uh, in the lowest uh, 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 income quintiles. Uh, and it was just a huge windfall to, to the highest earning households in the country. And what's not shown here is corporate, corporate uh, tax breaks that also were part of that tremendous uh, uh, windfall of tax cuts. And finally, I'll mention, you know, Trump's actions, both in policy and in word um, and deeds on the um, on, uh, on the front of racial equity and really channeling white supremacy in so many ways. You know, we all remember his comment after the Charlottesville events of 2017, uh, his uh, militarized response to the Black Lives Matter and uh, racial justice uprising over the summer. Uh, I will speak to this a little bit more uh, in a few moments. There were other areas we cataloged in the, in the Lancet Commission uh, related to things like the attacks on reproductive health, on a nutrition policy rollback. There's a lot more, and I think I'm gonna leave you to read the report to get more of the uh, details on that. But let me step now from four years and talk about 40 years. So for sure, uh, Donald Trump spent four years committing malpractice on the health of Americans, but the patient was sick long before Trump took office and COVID-19 arrived. And the disturbing truth is that many of Trump's policies did not represent a radical break with the past, but rather they accelerated a 40 year long trend of lagging life expectancy in the United States. And this was something we really focused on in the commission is I don't think we went in to the report realizing that you had to understand the Trump years in the context of really what has been a very problematic situation for decades in the United States for health policy and health related policies. So I previously showed you a slide of the decrease in life expectancy in the United States. And this slide puts it in international context and it documents the widening gap in life expectancy in the United States relative to the other G7 nations. And what you can see here is, um, is until about 1980, the United States was in the middle of the pack with these other G7 nations in terms of life expectancy. And then it started falling off in 1980. And you can see how far behind the other nations we are now in life expectancy by 2020. And for the Lancet Commission, we said, hmm, 
let's calculate what this actually amounts to. If life expectancy in the US had been the same as the average life expectancy in other wealthy nations, how many fewer deaths would have occurred, occurred in the United States? And that's what this next slide uh, shows. And this is based on the research of Commissioner David Bohr and his colleagues, which shows the steady increase in what we call the number of missing Americans per year. These are the number of excess deaths in the United States every year relative to how many people would have died if we had the same death rates as the average of all the other G7 nations. And you see back in 1980, there were no excess deaths, but year by year, it's been climbing. This is an accumulative tally. This is each year how many more uh, deaths are occurring in the United States and otherwise would have occurred if we had the same life expectancy as the other G7 nations. So by 2018, 461,000 Americans went missing. And that's more than the number of lives lost in the United States due to COVID in 2020. So it is a big and tragic number. The other thing this graph shows is presidential administrations along the bottom of the figure. And you can see the first administration listed here is that of Ronald Reagan. And it's not a coincidence that the divergence of life expectancy in the United States from the other G7 nations began during the Reagan administration. Reagan's victory signaled the end of the New Deal and the civil rights order and a decisive turn to conservative policies that eroded social programs enacted under democratic administrations that had improved health and reduced racial disparities. And even as productivity grew in the 1980s and 90s, the rewards flowed to firms' owners, wages flattened, jobs became increasingly precarious, and life expectancy began to lag. Many of Trump's policies, such as windfall tax cuts for the rich, increasing privatization of Medicare, and rollbacks of environmental protections, were rooted in Reagan-era conservatism. Now, illustrative of the consequences of this policy shift in this 40-year epoch is a tremendous growth in income inequality. So what this graph does is divide uh, the population and shows people in the lowest half of household income in the United States. And the blue line are the households in the top 1% of household income in the United States. And it shows what is their share of total national wealth, total national income. And what you can see for sure, you know, there was always more wealth among this top 1% uh, relative to the share of the population, but it was a fairly stable relationship between uh, wealth in these two groups until 1980. And that's a period where you see the steady increase in the share of income that's, that's commanded by people in that top 1% and a declining share to, the, to that half of people in this country uh, in, the, in the bottom half of income. Um, um, so let me show you another trend that had an inflection point in 1980. So this is healthcare spending. Until about 1980, this is again comparing health spending as a percent of gross domestic, domestic product in the United States uh, compared to other nations. And you see, we were fairly comparable. We were maybe a little bit at the top compared to these four other nations in the G7, but you know, kind of were in the pack. And what you can see again year by year is a separation of the percent of our overall wealth in this country that goes to healthcare compared to spending in these other nations. So now by 2018, expenditures in the United States as a percent of GDP were 60% greater than spending in the next highest spending country. So how do we reconcile these two facts? That the United States has the highest healthcare spending in the world by far, but has life expectancy that's 3.4 years less than that in comparable nations. So one answer is the failure over many decades now to invest in the conditions that make for a healthy population. I mean, we enact tax cuts for the wealthy and like giant corporations like Amazon pay nothing in taxes. And other nations raise more in progressive taxes and spend that money on the public good, free universal education, paid parental leave, housing subsidies, all the types of things that contribute to healthy lives. The United States is also unrivaled in its profligate waste in healthcare spending. I showed you a little bit of some of the profits and administrative costs, but here's another uh, uh, shocking number. This is actually the number of physicians in the United States compared to the number of managers in the healthcare sector. 
Uh, and again, you can see, particularly in this period, just this explosion with this crazy system of all these people working in administrative roles relative to the number of people working in actually healthcare delivery roles. Um, so you tell me, where is the value-based care, something we talk about in the United States, value, you know, when you get value-based care, where is value-based care in this ratio of managers to physicians? You know, and, and where else but in the United States would even end-of-life care be turned into a profit-making enterprise? Two-thirds of all hospices in this country are investor-owned. I mean, let me say that again. For those of us, particularly in family medicine, who I think are very involved in end-of-life care and making that uh, a process who's humane, uh, but if you actually look at hospice programs in the United States, two-thirds are now run as a business to return profits to shareholders. Something has gone wrong. So that's why many of us say, hmm, do we really have less of a healthcare system than a wealth care system? One that works well for the economic interests of the healthcare industry, uh, but not so much the, the health and interests of the public. And as this slide shows, uh, we really do have a system that seems to be working particularly well for the well-to-do. This is showing what percent of all healthcare spending in the United States were spent on the poorest 20% of people in this country and the richest 20%. And you see, you know, back in the 60s, more uh, proportionally was spent on, on higher income folks, but that changed after Medicaid and Medicare were enacted in the mid 60s, it reversed. And it would be appropriate to spend more on lower income groups because they have a lot more illness, a lot more healthcare needs. Uh, and then this all reversed again, uh, starting over the last 20 years right now. And so we're spending every year, we spend more per capita on the highest income people in this country relative to the lowest income people in this country. So, so far did the political compass move to the right under Reagan that even when Democrats won back the White House in the Clinton and Obama years, policies still tilted in a pro-market, pro-corporate direction. You know, President Obama's signature legislative achievement, the Affordable Care Act, was attacked by Republicans as a socialist takeover of American medicine. And this Time magazine cover shows um, Obama in the image of, you know, Roosevelt, of FDR. But the Affordable Care Act in truth was less the second coming of the New Deal than a recycling of policies first championed by Republicans. The ACA bolstered the private health insurance market through an individual mandate modeled on a state level plan in Massachusetts, signed into law by then Governor Mitt Romney. And then the ACA's employer mandate drew from the centerpiece of President Nixon's health reform proposal. Single payer uh, health reform, it was not. The final slide I'll share with you in this section is again based on the research of Jacob Bohr. And this also tracks life expectancy over time, but at the level of US counties. So the red line here are counties in the United States with a high proportion of people voting for Trump in 2016. And the blue line is counties in which Trump received a relatively low share of the vote. So this is showing counties over time, but the your counties are in one line or the other based on how they voted in 2016 national election. But what it's showing you is the life expectancy trends in these two groups of counties in the United States. And see, if you go back 40 years, the Trump counties uh, actually had life expectancy, Trump voting counties, it was better than those in the counties that, that were less likely to vote for Trump. But these lines again diverge. So you could see there's a sense in these counties that heavily voted for Trump, that their life opportunities, um, uh, their welfare had lagged behind those in many other country counties in the United States. And so I think the message there is economic dislocation and government austerity. And if you couple that with diversionary racist and nativist political appeals, it's not just bad for people's health, but it creates incendiary conditions that can threaten the health of our democracy. So that then takes me again back to Reagan. So Trump not only doubled down on the pro-market trickle-down economic policies unleashed in the Reagan years, he also borrowed from that era's political playbook of white supremacy. So for those of us who lived through this prior era, you know, 
remember that well before Trump talked about good people on all sides, fine people on all sides, um, President Reagan, when running for president in 1980, the year he was first elected, gave a campaign speech uh, in Philadelphia, uh, Mississippi. It was not a coincidence, again, that he gave a major campaign speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi. That was a site, and the site where he spoke was very close to where the KKK had murdered and buried three civil rights workers in 1965, 1964, in a very well-known case. And this was sending a message by giving a speech there about essentially where he stood relative to racial politics in this country. And as the Reagan administration dismantled social programs, black-white disparities and premature death and infant mortality that narrowed, uh, suddenly it started to widen. So I'll just, I wanna close in a little bit more on this theme. I know we're running a few minutes behind, but uh, I'm gonna just spend a couple more minutes because you have to step back and put this in a 400 year perspective. Um, you know, COVID has really made this clear. And I think we're increasingly having to understand these things are rooted deeply in centuries of structural racism, not just um, sort of things that are, it's not just about interpersonal bias and discrimination, but deeply uh, entrenched structural systemic racism. So this is true in COVID. And you see, you know, the, the reduction in life expectancy 19, uh, in 2019 uh, is baseline compared to what happened last year with COVID. And we can see among Latinx, a, a three-year a loss of life expectancy among African-Americans more than a two-year. Uh, whites, it's less than a year loss of life expectancy. And this is all connected to risk of exposure through things like inequalities in housing, in the types of jobs people have, in lack of control over ability to work from home, um, in things that are deeply rooted in these inequities in social circumstances. It's particularly alarming to look at where the XX deaths are so disparate. So this is just the relative a rate of deaths uh, among these racial ethnic groups compared to whites. And here you're gonna see particularly loss of life in younger age groups that are so dis, uh, disparate from that in the referent population of whites. And I would also say Asian populations have also suffered excess mortality from COVID. Um, the other structural problem is, is wealth is such a determinant of people's ultimate opportunities for health. And it's not just about income, it's about overall wealth. And what you can just see is, you know, if you look at 2016, 10 times higher wealth on average in a white family in the United States, white household, than an African-American uh, family uh, or a Latinx family. So again, deep structural problems. Uh, uninsured, uh, racial disparities there. Again, uh, when you look at the states that did not implement Medicaid expansion, predominantly in states that had a higher than average proportion of residents who were African-American in places like Texas, Latinx. So again, no coincidence with these structural problems that um, prevented the Affordable Care Act of ensuring as many people as it otherwise could have. Indian Health Service, again, spending on the Indian Health Service, uh, quite low compared to spending on things like Medicare per capita or, or the VA per capita. So I think I will actually, let me just close on this one just again, structural racism manifested in absolutely no progress on the percent of medical students in the United States who are African-American or black. Just a flattening of that, which again, deeply rooted in structural problems of educational opportunity. This is, I mean, this is mass incarceration and the disproportionate number of, of people of color that are incarcerated rather than uh, providing opportunities for people to become physicians. So on that, let me turn it over to Juliana. And I don't wanna end you know, by just bumming you out and giving you all the bad news, but I think it is really critical to understand uh, Trump was not a complete aberrancy, that these things are rooted in um, political tendencies that have been going on for several decades. And then many that are so deeply entrenched in the way our society has been uh, constructed, particularly around um, the traditional, the first sin of, a genocide of indigenous populations and then enslavement of Africans. But there is hope and the commission focused on this. So let me now 
turn it over to Juliana to talk with you more about how we move forward. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Grumbach, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to be here today. It's, um, it's really nice to be back with the FCM community, albeit virtually. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo the feeling of heaviness from all that we just heard about. And um, one of the things that made me really proud to be part of the commission was how there was this focus on action. And we put together an ambitious set of 30 recommendations that span the breadth of the topics covered in the report and really focused on what would it take to achieve lasting structural equity, restore public health infrastructure, promote global solidarity and more. So we'll be going through the recommendations. I apologize that the slides are a little text heavy. We just felt that it was really important to put all the content out there. And um, in part, as a reminder that there's so much work to do, which can feel very overwhelming and reminds us that we all have a role that we can play and plug into. So one encouraging thing is that some of the recommendations for executive action that we put forth have already started to be addressed by the Biden administration. For example, we see here, we've seen action related to COVID-19 response, the Paris Climate Accords, a private prison ban, revoking anti-immigrant executive orders, undoing the global gag rule. And of course, many of these are yet to be fully implemented and we'll have to see how they play out. Uh, but it is encouraging to see this movement right off the bat. Next slide, please. In addition, uh, we recommended executive action in a number of areas that are still pending or are currently under review. So for example, enforcing voting rights, including equity measures and criteria for NIH and CDC grants, Justice Department oversight in, on racist policing, decriminalizing substance use, reversing the public charge rule, expanding access to sexual health services and more. Legislatively, the recommendations cover many key areas. For example, some of the first you see here focus on investments in our communities, particularly addressing structural racism and the impacts on those who have been historically oppressed. And these include a call for reparations, investments in the Indian Health Service, a just immigration reform, and upgrading Puerto Rico's status to ensure equal treatment. There were also recommendations related to investments in public infrastructure and social programs, including the Green New Deal, single payer health care, universal free school meals, housing for all, and robust substance use treatment. Next slide. We also called for legislation to roll back harmful policies and to divest from harmful systems, including restricting gun sales, enacting campaign finance reforms, repealing the Hyde Amendment, strengthening labor protections, and cutting defense spending. And lastly, we included legislative recommendations to promote global solidarity, including the elimination of harmful trade agreements that restrict pharmaceutical access and an increase in foreign aid up to the UN recommended target. So overall, these recommendations aim to not only redress the harms of the Trump administration and the preceding 400 years, uh, but also to chart a path forward and advance a vision of a just, equitable and healthy future for us all. So the last section of the report talks about what will it take to get there. We start from an understanding that throughout history, the most impactful wins for health equity have been hard fought, hard won, and led by people closest to the pain. And we're seeing that playing out today. I mean, we, we saw earlier some of the wins thus far with Biden's executive orders. Many of those are a result of the tireless work of activists on the ground and continued pressure. And we know that the Biden-Harris presidency itself is a product of this 
POC, POC led largely women and queer led organizing in battleground states. So when we think, what will it take to enact this broad health centered agenda, agenda, we benefit from keeping that knowledge at the center. We also discuss in this last section how we are at a really critical moment filled with potential as really important it is to acknowledge the gravity of where we are. We also see the silver lining that the harsh policies of the Trump administration along with national reckoning against racist police violence and the unconscionable inequities of COVID-19 have caused more people to wake up and become politically activated and engaged. And now with the new administration, we have the opportunity to turn this political consciousness and movement energy into true proactive political change and not only be on the defensive. To do this, we have to avoid complacency, continue to engage, work in coalition, maintain a clear and unapologetic, unapologetic vision about the world we want to see. And quoting the report, the success of recent movements will be measured by whether they initiate a new era of progress not just the ending of the Trump era. So lastly, in this section, we discuss the particular role that health workers can play in social movements. We write healthcare professionals can lend expertise, voice, cultural capital, and their presence in public protests and organizing with others to bolster movements for change. And we go through some examples of this. So again, a reminder that there's so many different ways that we can be involved and we all have a role to play. And that's the message of hope we tried to wrap up the report with. Wow, I wanna thank you, Juliana and Kevin for an incredibly poignant, thoughtful and yet optimistic uh, presentation with some, with some real hope uh, for us all. We've got some fantastic questions in the chat um, and I'm going to hand it over to Michelle to ask some of those questions. One of the questions, I'll take the easy one first though, was will you share slides? And uh, we got a yes from that. And in addition, the session is being recorded. So we are very grateful um, to our presenters for sharing slides. And I'm going to let Michelle ask some of the other questions. And again, if we don't get to your questions, um, apologies, and we will encourage you to reach out directly to our presenters. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, thank you, Margo. And feel free to keep continuing to send the, mess the questions. We are still reading them. So the first one actually is to, Zunga, is to Dr. Grumbach. Um, Since the increased profits seen by health insurers in 2020 are likely due to reduce use of slash spending for non-COVID um, medical care during the pandemic, have there been any efforts at the state or federal policy levels to require health insurers to return a portion of the premiums to policyholders? Uh, surprisingly little to my knowledge. Um, and it's, there are some under the Affordable Care Act, there are some restrictions on how much can be retained uh, and not actually spent on actual healthcare delivery. But it's, I, I think a lot of the insurance companies are saying, oh, well, that was a one-time deal and now we're gonna get, you know, there's gonna be catch-up spending. So we need to use that reserves for the following year. So, uh, I mean, uh, I think, again, there's just so little accountable, accountability in how our premium dollars are spent and our tax dollars are spent by um, insurance companies, which are overwhelmingly now investor-owned companies. Yeah, definitely with the privatization of our healthcare system, it's a little bit harder for um, those who actually benefit from health insurance to actually say something about it. Um, another question, which I think will go to both of you, is how likely um, are the Biden-Harris administration to take up these recommendations that have been laid out in the Lancet? Julia, do you want me to start, Juliana? Do you want to take a stab at that? Uh... Well, I, I, I would just say that I think some of them might be taken up, I think a lot of them will require continued advocacy and pushing and working in broad based coalitions. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's the, the executive actions I think we're encouraged by. I think Juliana put it really well. I think they, but even those they need to, 
it's one thing to issue them, it's another to follow through and make sure things are implemented fully. So I think it will need continued vigilance and pressure as Juliana is talking about to, to hold people accountable. Uh, I think the legislative ones, we're all seeing this play out with the COVID Relief Act, that mm -hmm. it's gonna pass through reconciliation. Uh, but when you're talking about Green New Deal or all these other policies, it's gonna be impossible to pass any of that legislation until they deal with the filibuster. So I think that's gonna be the next moment of truth for both the Biden administration and Schumer and other congressional leaders is, are they gonna be willing to get rid of the filibuster? Because I think if they do, then there are a number of other policies the commission recommended that could be enacted. Now, again, you have some more moderate conservative Democrats that you'd have to win over, but there's, you know, there's voting rights reforms. There's, I think, environmental policies. Um, uh, maybe not a full Green New Deal, but something that would move in that direction. $15 minimum wage, tax, tax, tax policy to repeal some of those windfall taxes. I think those I could see passing if one could uh, put the filibuster to rest. Um, but I, I mean, it all comes back to, I it's just gonna require determined advocacy by folks saying, we can't settle for halfway measures. I think that was such an overwhelming conclusion in the Lancet Commission is that in the past, past 40 years, I mean, the Affordable Care Act is a good example. The Democrats settled for, well, you know, we have to pull back and they took a few Republican ideas. Republicans didn't vote for it anyway. They got no votes for the Affordable Care Act. And yet then the policies are watered down. So I think people have learned their lessons that they just have to go bold and go big uh, and then keep activists holding them accountable to, to policies that will really make a difference. Definitely. And let me see, there were a couple of them that I like to clump together. I think we've gotten a lot of questions about us. Uh, California has a new legislation for a single payer um, act and want to get some thoughts from you all about, you know, can they make a difference for us in California? Um, given the political climate right now, overall. Julian is on the East Coast now, but I know as a, as a former California, yeah, do, you, do you want to speak to the single payer movement at all, Juliana? Oh, I'll, I'll leave this one to you. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's always challenging to try to do a state-based single payer plan because you totally need the cooperation of the federal government. Now that's made change now with a Democratic administration in the White House and more congressional receptivity to it. Um, I, I have to actually brush up on that. Maybe people can educate us about the latest uh, single payer move that was uh, put into state legislation. There, the Newsom did uh, appoint a universal care commission because I remember speaking to that commission maybe in January, December of 2019, 2020. It was just before COVID. And then that all got put on on hold, but you know the governor had been on record saying he was supportive of single payer and put this commission together. There was a bit of resistance, particularly in the assembly, where the speaker of the assembly had held up a single payer bill before. So I think again, it's it's the same issue. If if there is enough activism, if there's enough holding people accountable, I think using the opportunity of the COVID to say it's you know we've learned the lesson of what it means to have a fragmented, inadequately. A covered population, how difficult it is for vaccination, because we don't even have a system of knowing everybody is in the same system, a way to track and deliver vaccinations. Compare this to what's going on in the United Kingdom with everybody registered with a general practitioner and GPs handling a lot of the immunizations. Uh, again, I, I hope momentum is building. And just for a clarification for folks who are not uh, familiar, I actually had to just look this up too. The bill is AB1 is AB 1400 and the new system that they would be promoting would be called CalCare, C-A-R-E. Definitely something for us to follow up on, I think. Thanks, Michelle. I and really, then, oh, go ahead, Michelle. I was gonna say, I, I, um, I think we probably have time for one more question and then I'm gonna ask, one more very brief question and then I'm gonna ask uh, Juliana and Kevin each to give us a few words of hope to send us off. Uh, into our afternoon activities with before we conclude. I know there's a lot of questions that we're not gonna to get to directly in the chat today, um, but I would encourage you to reach out directly to Kevin and Juliana and continue and Michelle and continue the dialogue. So maybe Michelle, one more question, thanks. 
Let me ask this one. This one seems really interesting. It's actually kind of comparing and contrasting. Um, have there been similar analysis in European countries with the rise of restrictive policies and reduced civil rights? Um, this person mentions Islamo Gauchism specifically. I don't know that term myself. Islamo, oh, this is in France, I think maybe. Is this, uh, yeah. Um, Correct. We, you know, the it was interesting to have a few people from uh, Britain and Canada on the commission to bring in the global perspective. There is such concern that Trump, again, is representative of this rise of autocrats, of nationalists, of uh, nativists promoting people across the globe. Um, it hadn't progressed to the stage of, you know, where it had in the United States. I mean, certainly in some of the Eastern European countries like Hungary, I mean, it's, it's pretty grim Poland, but um, threatening in other countries in the G7, for example. So I think I don't know, I don't, I, I mean, I can't speak to having expertise of knowing like what's happened with the state of the health of people of, you know, Muslim backgrounds in France or North African immigrants in France and others. I think a lot of these issues are active in those countries. I think there are presumably similar health impacts of these types of policies. I think that's why that's partly why the Lancet Commission was created by uh, Richard Horton, I think, was this concern that what's happening in the United States is portends a very cold, you know, wind of political change across the globe that could be so damaging to the health of people as well as the planet. So I, I think these concerns are prominent across the globe. I can't speak to the specific research on some of the health impacts in those countries. Well, I'm looking through the questions on the chat and there are so many really rich and wonderful questions that I hope will continue the dialogue. But in the interest of time, I wanna give each of you um, just a couple moments to briefly wrap us up with something to take home to really remember this uh, by. So. Kevin, do you want to go first? I will, but I want to say, I took, Julia, I thought you did such a beautiful job of capturing the spirit and what's required for change. Um, I think it's sort of, it's a, and it's really interesting to have this generational you know, difference because I'm looking back and when I look at the data, I sort of share it, I'm saying, you know, we knew how to do better. We, we did better under the New Deal of the Roosevelt administration. Oh, for sure there were racist policies and our social security was, enacted, but there's a history of major progressive legislation that happened in the New Deal, that happened in the presidency of Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society and civil rights legislation. So I'm encouraged that like, no, we have done this before. We have enacted sweeping legislation that's quite progressive and quite health promoting. Uh, and so we have to go back to tap into those roots. But then I turn it over to Juliana because it has to be the wind behind that, I think, needs to be sort of the next generation who is really not going to stand for half-assed measures and are going to hold us all accountable. So, Juliana, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that our experience over the past year has shown us that another world is possible. And sadly, it has been a world of suffering and a lot of adaptation, learning to be caring within our communities, changing how we live our day-to-day -day lives. And it's a reminder that things can change and things can change drastically and quickly if there is the will. So I, I think that we can hold tight to those lessons as well as we move forward and, and process the, the helpful comprehensive recommendations of this report. Thank you, thank you uh, everybody for being here today, um, uh, for especially for everybody who engaged in asking thoughtful questions and for all of those who, you will, be, who will be asking thoughtful questions uh, that are not in the chat of each other because of this. Um, Kevin, Juliana, Michelle, you've all let us in a, a really provocative um, uh, and wonderful first session for Grand Rounds. I hope everyone can join us uh, the first Friday of the month, uh, next one being in April for our next session, which will be on vaccine hesitancy with a panel discussion. Um, and again, I really uh, appreciate everyone's help in launching this session. You, um, uh, you've you given us a lot to think about as we move into the future. So thank you so much. 
Thank you, Martin and the whole team for setting us up so well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.